We are in Champions League, man. That was my dilly next question. Dilly dong, come on. Into Sheringham and so sure it's won it. I will love it if we beat them. Love it. This is the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast with Gary Kearney. Hello, welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. Joining me for this episode is Jordan Angeli. She is a former professional player with the Boston Breakers, Washington Spirit, New York Flash. She's now moved on to TV broadcasting and is the founder of the ACL Club, which is the focus of this podcast, coaching players who have had injuries, ACL, serious long-term injuries, what ways can we support them? How can we help them with the recovery? How can we keep them connected to the team? How can we assist with their return to play? Unbelievable insight and advice from Jordan this here. We'd love to hear your thoughts. It's a topic that we've never covered before. So interested to hear what you think about this. At Gary Kernin on Twitter. At Gary Kernin on Instagram. And a special thank you to all the listeners. We just recently hit the 1 million listener mark last week so very very excited and very very surprised to get that kind of numbers up with a podcast and obviously can't do it without you obviously can't do it without the guests so big big thank you we're looking at trying to improve it trying to maybe hit a different topic or two maybe trying to go in a different direction one of the things that we're looking to improve on the podcast is to merge it with webinars and maybe bring a little bit of visuals in terms of the tactics, tactical analysis, training aspect that you can work with your team. So using that and incorporating that with the Modern Soccer Coach platform is what we're looking to do starting in September. So basically there will be one webinar each month. We'll also do one or two informal ones. The first one is defensive transitioning. So I'm going to do that on September 23rd. I'm going to look at counter pressing, how to win the ball back aggressively, how to set up shape for that, how to work in the training pitch with that with your teams. The webinar will be $20, but will be free for all coaches who are members of the Modern Soccer Coach Community Platform. So if you haven't looked at that please go ahead and check it out there's 250 odd sessions there's already about six or seven webinars up there there's daily content there's interactions with coaches lots of discussions pretty lively platform we're going to kick that off with more webinars as well so every member of the modern soccer coach platform it's only six dollars a month they'll get access to every single webinar and like i said we'll also do some informal ones as well We'll take a couple of Q&A sessions. We'll bring on a few guest coaches and we'll try and connect the podcast to a little bit of video as well and see what happens there. So super excited to do it. Please check out the Modern Soccer Coach platform if you haven't already. I'll put the link in the bio of this podcast. Okay, here is Jordan and her insight. Enjoy. Jordan, thanks so much for joining me today on the Modern Soccer Coach podcast. Very excited to have you on. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Gary. And um yeah, I am not currently a soccer coach, but I like that I have a different perspective to hopefully add to what these soccer coaches think about. Well, I think that perspective is very much needed, especially with something that we all know, we're all aware of. Injury prevention is probably, along with culture and player development, probably the three most used terms for coaches. Mm-hmm. But we don't actually talk a lot about the how and the what after the injury. And I'm really excited to go down this road because I'm going to learn a lot here. So um, let's go straight in. You, you've you've set up the, the ACL Club. Talk to us about your type of journey there and the inspiration behind it. Yeah, the journey was, oh gosh, it feels long and um, short at the same time because once the idea hit me I was like of course this is what I need to do but I got to the point where I wanted to start the ACL club because I had gone through three ACL injuries on my left knee in my career two within a year when I was playing at Santa Clara University Um, my junior the spring of my junior year in the spring of my senior year so I ended up taking a red shirt and a medical red shirt so I was um, actually in college for six technically six seasons. Um, and so I had that injury and then I recovered, played, got drafted, uh, to the Boston breakers and WPS and 
had a really, really fun rookie year. Uh, got to play with some of the world's best, like Kelly Smith, Alex Scott, uh, Lauren Holiday. Uh, at that time, Lauren Chaney, Lindsay Tarpley, Leslie Osborne, uh, Amy LaPelda. I mean, my team was unbelievable. Alyssa Nair. Um, and had I like actually benefited really a lot from that. I scored a lot of goals because everyone's like, Mark Chaney. And <laughs> I was just was the person not marked. So, um, But we just really worked well together. So that brought me... Um, into a place in my career that I had already always wanted to get. And it was with the U S women's national team. So, um, almost won the rookie of the year, my, my first year in WPS and then got a call up with the national team. And then unfortunately my first game of my second WPS season, I got tackled. And of course my left leg was planted. And of course I, I tore my ACL. And, um, in that moment I was literally praying, like, let my leg be broken. Cause I was not prepared for another ACL recovery. Um, and so during this, like it, a lot of people that I played with, my coaches were always, you know, really impressed with how mentally tough I was on the field, um, prepping for games, whatever it may be. But this recovery was so hard for me mentally. And I was like, man, if it's hard for me, I can only imagine how hard it would be for somebody who doesn't have those skills like I have as far as like the mental side of the game. And so I realized right then, like I have to create something that addresses the mental side of injury recovery and specifically ACL injury because it is such a longer injury and it affected me and my career so much. Um, I just, you know, and it clearly is. And I think we have to talk about this, Gary, like it's an epidemic. There are are too many players like I hear about 12 year old girls now tearing their ACL and that really never used to happen. Um, if it did, it was very rare. Um, but the number of ACL injuries that is happening is an epidemic and it needs to be addressed. And so, um, I definitely am helping with, you know, I'm like, I'm very much in the mindset that like injuries can't be prevented. You can reduce the risk of injuries that are going to happen, but we all know you play a sport, you participate in activity, there is a risk that you could get injured. Um, but can we reduce that risk? So although that is like a big part of what I am, I have my eyes set on, like how do we implement things that help reduce the risk of this injury happening in our athletes? I also am under, you know, this, this knowledge that Injuries are going to happen and these players need to have something that they can lean on and know that they're heard, understood, and that they feel empowered to get through this process and be a better person and player when it's over. So that's kind of how the ACL club uh, came about. And um, the name came from I when I, the first time I tore my ACL, I was lying on my couch that night and just, a, you know, a mess like not, I hadn't had my MRI. I wasn't really, I didn't know what I did, but I knew like, you know, when you tear your ACL, you're just like, I think that was it. And, uh, one of my teammates, Tina Estrada, she actually is an assistant coach now at San Jose state university. Tina came over and she sat on the couch and she was asking me these questions and she looked me in the eyes and she said, well, kid, welcome to the club. And I was so mad at that moment. Like, oh, I don't want to be in the club. Like, I don't want to be a part of this. And as I went through my recovery, I started to understand what it meant to be a part of the club. And it was something so beyond just like the injury. It was the perseverance and the persistence and uh, the mentality to get through the ups and downs and this community that is so supportive of one another and would answer any question that that came about and a bond that I had with these people, even, you know, clearly the people that I knew, but even people that I didn't know. And I would see them at the gym with a knee scar and I'd say, Hey, did you tear your ACL? And right away we would know that we had gotten through something um, that the other person had gotten through. So it kind of bonds you in a special way. So yeah, that's kind of the creation and, and what I'm trying to do with the ACL club in a, in a nutshell, I guess. <laughs> Whenever you hear about people, you know, especially towards the latter stages of their college career. So many, like you're right, it is an epidemic and so many mm -hmm. have done it in their 14, 15, 16, 17 years of mm -hmm. age. Once they start to get their second, it starts to become in the, un, the elephant in the room almost that, hey, this is this could almost wrap up your career. You went through the third and what you're saying there is like, the third was whenever you were a professional player, you were a senior player, but also it wasn't, 
an automatic, you know, on paper, it looks great. You know, I looked at it last night. I'm like, wow, third one, 10 minutes yeah. into the WPS. But it wasn't as easy as you just being born with resilience and fortitude and getting through it. Yeah, no, it definitely, it definitely wasn't that easy. I think, um, I mean, even when I talk about that, right there, you know, it brings up emotions because it still is emotional. Like, mm. um, it's one of those things where, after each recovery, um, I changed something that I did, you know, my first surgery, actually, um, I had to go back in to get a scope between my first and my second surgery. Cause I had a, a big, um, ball of scar tissue, which they call a cyclops. So I had to go get that removed. And, um, I didn't know it at the time, but my mom was there and the doctor came in and I guess I was talking to the doctor, but I don't remember it at all. But the doctor told me that my graft was already fraying. Um, which is not a good thing when you're thinking about a, a ligament that is supposed to protect your knee joint, um, that it's coming apart is, is, um, a very hard thing to kind of wrap your brain around. So between that one and the next one, I changed my, my rehab and I changed the person that I went to rehab with thinking like, Hey, if I'm going to do this again, I can't do the same thing over and over again. Right. That's the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Um, and then the same thing on the third time, like I switched the type of graft I did and, um, you know, didn't really feel, honestly, didn't feel like in my first two being at, in college that I had the ability to choose what graft I wanted, what surgeon I wanted and, um, what recovery or what rehab I wanted when that's like one of the biggest things I tell people is, is this is your journey and nobody is going to fight for you like you're going to fight for you. So if you don't feel comfortable with anything that's happening, if you don't feel comfortable with the surgeon that the school tells you you have to go to, say, sorry, I need to go see somebody else. I need to go see what my options are because there is something about that. You know, it's just a gut feeling that you get. And I never felt comfortable. And I think I didn't understand the difference between not feeling comfortable and just doing something that was unknown to me. Right. Cause you don't know what it's like going through this whole process until you're in it and you have to make all these decisions. And, um, so for me, I I tell people like, that's why I want to empower people. Like this is your journey and you get to choose all the steps. You get to choose who your team is that you like create around you. Who's your surgeon? Who's your PT? Who's your support system? Like, Those are choices that you get to make in order to allow yourself to get back to where you want to be, um, which is on the field, which is the same or even better level than you were before. And so, um, yeah, you learn a lot about yourself. It wasn't easy. Like I, my parents would like have heard the worst of it, you know, of, of all the breakdowns that I had and just, um, you know, you go through all the emotions, like, why is this happening to me? Especially after the third time, but Um, I really, I am like a true believer in that everything happens for a reason. And I, I think, um, that I was put on this path and I tore my ACL in three different ways and I had different graft choices and I, you know, my recoveries were all different in order to help other people and, and be able to empathize with other people. So the ACL club and creating this community was really, it felt so right because I feel like my life um, just led me on that path kind of, unfortunately in some moments naturally. Right. But in the end, I do feel like I'm, I'm doing what I I'm supposed to be doing, which is, uh, helping other athletes hopefully avoid what I went through is, is that multiple injury. Yeah. It's amazing because when you're talking about changing the perspective of taking control and, and like, it's, it's really powerful when you're saying about how you basically need to stand up and fight for, you and your career and your future and make yeah. it like you're then equipping players to shape and take on new character strengths yeah. and beliefs then as well which is obviously going to make them better and stronger people as well yeah and it's it's really interesting because a lot of the things that i feel like i learned in the recovery process are things that aren't naturally taught to us in sports like i am a i am a full like full on believer of a lot of the things that sport teaches you. But one of the things that sports sport teaches you is like, um, in that regard is like, okay, this is what we're supposed to do. And we do what we're supposed to do because that's what we're told that we're supposed to do. Well, if something doesn't feel right, like we have to say like, this doesn't feel right. Like, um, and like being a part of the team, a lot of the times you just have to do what the team does. And I am all about that. Right. Like I was probably number one team player on, 
the majority of my teams, right? Like, um, but I, I think that there's also moments that we have to learn to stick up for ourselves when things don't feel right. And, um, yeah, so empowering people to feel that way. But also one of the things that I think is, um, hard with sport is like, we are constantly asked to push beyond our limits, right. Um, to tough things out, to like rub dirt on it and keep going to like shake off a head injury, like all these things that I don't think we are meaning to like growing up, like head injuries definitely are not shaken off anymore. Right. But like when I was growing up, that was something that we just did is like, you get knocked in the head and you're like, Ooh, are you okay? Okay. Keep playing. And like, we're starting to realize that this mentality is there, there has to be a line drawn in the sand where it's like, okay, yes, you have to push beyond limits in some things, but in this recovery, if you're in pain and you're pushing beyond it, it's actually going to cause you a longer recovery because that pain is telling you, okay, something's not wrong right in my knee. And maybe I need to back off, figure out why it hurts and then go from there. Like you can't, this is not an injury recovery that you can just like outwork Mm -hmm. the person next to you. There are things that are beyond your control that um, I think if we go by that, like, Oh, just push through the pain mentality. uh, It doesn't set you up for success in this injury recovery. So um, yeah, there, there there's so many little things that I think character building things that, uh, that you're taught in this recovery that I, um, I wanted, I want people to feel like, okay, if this is happening to me, like I have two choices here, I can like wallow in it and say like, why is this like constantly throughout the whole journey? Like I'm never going to get better. I ha- I don't, I have this fixed mindset that now I'm broken to change that mindset to a growth mindset and say, okay, yes, I got injured. Yes. I am. I was upset. I'm going to give myself this amount of time to feel the pain and the emotions and if that pops up, I'm going to feel it, but then I'm going to tell myself, I have to reset my mindset. I have to re, um, re up my belief in myself and my ability to use this as a a growth step. Right. So, um, really changing your mindset and how you approach each and every day and, and allowing feelings to come up and addressing those, but not allowing them to, um, hold you back in your belief that like you can get through this. So it's a really intricate process. And like, even for me at times working with these athletes, I'm so thankful that I've built a team around me of sports psychologists and mind mindfulness coaches and people who have expertise in these areas, because a lot, some of the times it's like beyond me. Um, some of the things that are, I hear from, from athletes or people that connect with the ACL club but really what these, I, I have found what these athletes want is just someone that understands these feelings that they're going through. It's just someone to say, yeah, I get that. Um, and I believe that you can get through it. And we all want connection, right? We all want to feel like we're connected to one another. And um, this, this club and this injury have really connected a lot of people in a really special way. Let's talk about coaches and how we can help deal with it or help assist, help support. You had Tony DeChico when you did it the third time, who is one of the greatest coaches and leaders of of the women's game. How was he through this? How did he help? Yeah, Tony, um, Tony was amazing. Ooh, I hope I don't cry right now. Um, he, he has coached for so long, right? By the time I had gotten to him. And so he'd seen a lot of things and, um, I just remember him supporting me in whatever I felt like was right for me. Um, so he, when I found out that I, I mean, I knew right away I tore my ACL and, um, I got, we got back to Boston and I met with a couple doctors, but then I was like, Tony, I, I need to go home. Like I can't be here. And he was super supportive of that. And, um, he's, he's such a good man and such a, uh, a good family man. He understands the importance of like the people that you surround yourself and that support you through everything, how, how much you need them in those times. And so he was like, yeah, go home for as long as you want. So, um, he was, he was great. And one of the things, you know, I think it was different at that point in my career because I, I understood how important, important doing things for myself was. Whereas when I was in college, um, I, I think, 
I didn't really understand that. And um, I mean, Jerry Smith was amazing as well. And unfortunately that year that I got injured, we had uh, five other players within that year that had torn their ACL too. So it was just like, it was a slap in the face. How, how crazy that, you know, our injury rate was that year. Um, But what I really have learned through this whole process is like, people don't know what they don't know right? Mm. If you have not been through an ACL injury, you don't really know what to expect. So for coaches, the advice that I would, I would give them is the player and it's all different ages, right? So some players will come up to you, but some players are too nervous to talk to their coach or like make, make it seem like they uh, don't want to be a part of the team, but they just want to be understood. So I would say like schedule time to talk to your athletes. Like if someone gets injured, make sure you reach out to them and say, Hey, like I've never, I've never been through an ACL injury, but like, I want to understand more. So I need you to communicate with me. Right. I need you to tell me, Hey, like, um, I, I need to be at training and I need to have something to do to help the team. Okay. Well, as a coach, then I can give that responsibility to you. But if you feel the opposite way and you don't need to be at training and you feel like you need a break, but you don't say anything, the coach is going to go in with the same mindset as before, right? Like you want to be there. You want a responsibility, even though you're not on the field, but that's actually detrimental to that person. So I think a lot of it is on the player as to like have that communication, but as a coach too, and as somebody who's supposed to be leading a group of players, like it is your responsibility as well to make sure you're communicating them in in a way that is saying like, I don't understand if you don't. Um, And even if you do like, Hey, I want to help you. And you're going to be different than Sarah or Samantha who maybe I've, I've worked through it with before, but really is just communicating and saying, Hey, what can I help you with? What do you need to uh, work on? What do you need a break? Do you want to come to training, whatever it may be. But I think that the, the communication line, um, throughout the recovery and also implementing back into play. I think that's one of the, the times that is most crucial in this recovery, right? Because if you have a player, Gary, who's coming back, they are itching to play, right? They, they have been out six, seven, eight months and they want to get right back into it. But their training habits can't be the same as a player who has never had this injury or is not coming back from this recovery. So um, I think it's creating some kind of uh, rules where they, you know, they're working themselves back in. Maybe if you're doing double days, they don't need to do double days because or maybe they do a non-impact, some kind of bike ride or something where. Uh, they're not putting all that pressure on their joint because their joint is still trying to figure out what it feels like after this massive surgery. So you do have to be more aware of it, I would say, as coaches, and make sure that those communication lines are open and you're working together as far as, okay, how can we help you through the process and then uh, implement you back into play in a healthy way that doesn't like put too much stress and load on you too quickly. Yeah, that that communication piece is. I I learned this very very recently. We've had a player here who's coming back from a long term injury and young player, and it's probably two or three weeks into it at this stage. And I was waiting, you know, to because how do you get feedback? I've never worked with this player before. How do I get yeah. feedback? So and you know, I decided one one more. It was a slow morning, one of the mornings, and she's doing a re. And I thought I'll I'll get a chat there, and I expected you know ten minutes listen. And how do you feel? And this is what I've seen in training. And what do you think of kind of my evaluation so far? Mm-hmm. And it turned into an hour long conversation and it was all, you know, the floodgates open, not in terms yeah. of emotion, but in terms of conversation, because yeah. this was a player who was just crying out for a conversation about the return to play and where she th- thought she was, what she needs. And, and I just had no mm-hmm. idea. I walked away going, oh, my, I should have done that months ago. Right. And I think that's a really good point. And like, honestly, nice for you to be vulnerable in that situation and say, say like, hey, I should have done that earlier. Because I think especially with younger players and everybody's personality is different. So I think we can't like um, say, hey, this is what worked with her. So I'm going to do that with somebody else. Like, no, there, maybe somebody else's reaction is going to be so totally different. But 
I think if you don't have those, that line of communication open and the player doesn't feel comfortable coming to you, then it's really difficult for that player because they might just need a chat, right? Like they might just need to express things and get it off their chest. Cause sometimes the weight of just holding on to those, those fears and those emotions, it bogs us down that we can't even like see past it. And we just need someone to tell it to, right. Mm. To let go of it and just say it and then be like, hear from somebody else. Like, Hey, I'm here for you. Or, um, I understand that. And we'll work you back in. Well, that just like allows them to work through that, that emotion that they have in their, their, um, body. And so it's, it's really healthy for people to have those conversations. And, um, so that is like, so big time that you did that and like learned from that because yeah, that's one of the things that I think as in, then the return to play aspect too, is I, I talked to a girl who, um, recently who was going to preseason and she was going into preseason for college off of an ACL injury. So she really hasn't done, I mean, she's been working hard, but hasn't been integrated back into play really. And she went in and was doing everything, every single session with her college team. And I'm like, in no world should you be doing every single session coming off an ACL injury. Mm -hmm. Like you need to do one session probably in a double day and you might need to take a rest day and then you could do another session a rest day and then we'll get you to working every single day and then maybe like maybe double days are not even in it for you right and like that doesn't make you any less of a team player it actually teaches your teammates around you personal responsibility like hey i am i know that i'm coming off this huge injury and i know i can't do too much and like and they can have a conversation. Like I remember having conversations with my college team, like, Hey guys, in my pro team, when I was playing in Western New York, I was, we were training on turf every single day. And I remember going into preseason and like in the locker room, I was like, Hey guys, I just need to tell you, like, I have had three ACL injuries on my left knee. I've had seven surgeries. Like, I hope that me, I, I just want to let you know where I'm at as far as my training. And it might look different than your training. Like I might have to sit a day out and I hope you know where my heart is. Like my, I want to be out there every single second I can, but I also have to listen to what is right for my body. And I hope you can appreciate me coming to you now and saying, saying that, like, I will be so invested in this team and I will do everything I can to be out there every single day. But I also know that's not really the cards I've been dealt and I'm going to do my best to be out there when it matters. Um, you know, when, when I can be at my fullest and like, hopefully as long as I possibly can, right. Like hopefully it'll add to my longevity. So, you know, really honest and, and yeah, it hurts. It hurts not being out there at training, but, um, that integration back into play, it's, it's so important too. And something that you should not only work with the player on, but like their physical therapist or their sports performance person, like communication between all those lines is so important. And I know it adds more to, the coach's plate, but from a coach's standpoint, you want your players to be healthy. So those conversations allow you to have more numbers available on your team and better trainings and then better, hopefully results in game days. And, um, with all those lessons that they learn on top of that, by just seeing somebody like, um, take that responsibility as well. Yeah. On that then, uh, read a quote, Joanna Loman. I thought this was amazing. You're, she said, you're coming to terms with losing the person that you thought you were going to be. And I thought, wow, like what, what an amazing, powerful quote that is to be uh -huh. like, way like self-image, confidence, it, it just goes down a different road. And for me to look at that coach is now, I've, I've been in 15 years as a coach now, and, and, it, and that kind of hits me hard. If I saw that quote when I was 24, 25, 26, it has scared uh -huh. the life out of me. So should a coach ever look beyond their own staff into specialist counseling or psychology to help the player? Absolutely. I think that is uh, one of the things that is so it, it teaches. It also you're in all the, everything you do, right. You were literally, if you're a coach, you're teaching these athletes, how, how to solve problems really. And by, by bringing somebody else in, you're saying, Hey, I know a lot, but like, I don't know everything. And that shows, I think, shows people um, it's okay to ask for help, right? It's okay to go and use resources that are beyond yourself in order to 
in order to like get back to your best self or like treat a different part of this recovery. So yeah, I, I definitely think that, um, you know, and you're seeing it a lot with mental health, like NBA just hired every single NBA team now has to have a a psychologist on staff. And these are, these are the differences that are like, we're really starting to understand how big the mental game is. And, and we knew it was big, right? We've always known it was big because of quotes we've seen from Wayne Gretzky and Michael Jordan, like these people that have been super successful um, mm -hmm. w with this idea of like, it's all in your brain. And like what you're, what you're saying to yourself is like 90% of the battle, right? So we always knew it was big, but I think we're understanding that uh, using these people who have studied how to properly get through injuries on the psychology side, or even how to get through um, nerves or like showing up for a game and it being a, a big game. How do we work through that and uh, stay focused on the moment? Like it's really about figuring out what we can do in the moment that will help us get to where we want to go, no matter what we're doing. Right. So I, I absolutely think it's important. And I think that, um, you'll start to see those changes within clubs and organizations is like, they'll at least have somebody that they can go to as, Hey, if you need, if you need extra help, especially, you know, with the injury recovery, we have a sports psychologist that uh, we work with and at least be able to give that name. So um, that's one of the things that I was really excited about creating this recovery course for the ACL club is like, I, I always joke with people because um, I was in rehab for uh, physical therapy for seven years, all in all. Wow. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, seven years is like a doctorate de degree, right? So I like joke, I'm like, Jordan Angeli, comma, ACL, instead <laughs> of like MD. Um, <laughs> so I like definitely have a lot of experience with it, but I know that I don't know what these experts know as far as the mental side of things. So one of the things with the process, this recovery masterclass that I created is I got to build my own team, right? I tell people all the time when you're going through an injury recovery, like build your team, pick your PT, pick your doctor, uh, orthopedic surgeon, pick your support staff, pick your friend that you tell everything to pick your, you know, everything that, that all this, this team that surrounds you is, who you get to choose. And with this recovery course, I got to do just that, right? I got to pick, um, Stuart Singer, who is a phenomenal, yes, phenomenal sports top psychologist. Man. Top yeah. Man. Stu Singer. Um, and he is so good with, uh, mindfulness. So he did 14 different, uh, pieces of content for the course. I have, uh, a, three different sports psychologists I've worked with. Um, so I got to build this team. So then when people are watching these videos and they're like, Hey, I really connect with this person, then they can go connect with them if they need extra help, like, um, and use this as a platform to like spread the knowledge of these people who are doing really great things in the, the sport community on the mind, um, the mental side that, um, are there to help and they want to help. Right. And they want you to be able to do the best that you can do in this injury recovery and beyond. So, um, yeah, that's, it's, it's all about building your team. And, and that's one thing that I think, uh, clubs and organizations can do a good job of is like just giving an outlet or, or, uh, some, somebody on staff or as somebody supporting them that maybe isn't on staff that can speak to that mental side. Yeah, so are integrating your team within the team. You mentioned before about the player taking a little bit of responsibility for staying connected to the team and and staying emotionally involved in the team. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've I've experienced that in college as well, and I've experienced the how tough it is. I've experienced the player who's not as happy because they've they've you know it's it's caused social ramifications of being injured and spending time yeah. in the training room, etc where I've struggled is like, well, how do you as a coach facilitate, how do you help the player lead themselves? How do you facilitate that mm -hmm. without saying like, well, you need to get out there and cause you think yeah. you're just adding more onto them, aren't you? Right. I I think you go about it in this way. Uh, you have to go about it with an empathetic mindset, right? To say, okay, if I were in your shoes and I was doing what you were doing, right. Which a day in the life of somebody rehabbing is, um, and playing for, let's just say, a collegiate team. Uh, you have class, then you probably go to um, re 
the PT, like either the training room or you go to your PT and then you go to training and watch your team extra work just like for them trying to get back to being on the field. Right. So the day in the life, plus all the mental stuff, right. You are constantly evaluating how your body feels, what you can do. Um, is my knee okay? Am I walking too much? Am I not resting enough? Like all of these other things that are just like a constant scroll through your mind. So being empathetic to the fact that like, okay, their day looks a lot different than the person next to them whose healthy day looks right. Um, So going about it and having a conversation with that in mind and saying, hey, I'm, you know, what I I would like as a player, this is kind of the conversation that I would like is a coach to say, hey, like, I want you to know we're here for you and we want you to be involved as possible. Like, we want you at training every single day. We want you to be here. But I also understand that there are a lot of um, other things that are going on. And, um, I just want to work through this with you. Like if you feel like today is a day that you can be at training and you can be invested in what we're doing. And, um, then like, I want you there, but if it's a day where it just feels like it is going to be, it is going to be detrimental to your health to be there. You know, like there are days where you're just like, I cannot watch somebody running around on a field and laughing when I am like just yearning for that so bad that it's okay not to come to every training, but for there to be an open conversation and um, to say, Hey, we got, we have to work through this, right? This is going to look different from you for you um, than it is for anybody else. And like, I want to do what's best for you. And, And just being open to like every single player wants to be there. Right typically like they want to be a part of that team. If being a part of that team in the moment is not what's feeding them to be successful, then it's only hurting everybody. Right. Because then you bring somebody in with a, a, an attitude or a, they're in a mood that isn't allowing that, that, the, that feeds off of the group. Right. Cause the team is the biggest um, is number one priority. So if you're bringing somebody in that is just not mentally able to be there, then it's detrimental to the whole group. So I think just having that conversation, it's really just about, I think, about communication and being um, and everybody being on the same page that like, hey, I want to be here. I want to be a part of this. But like, I also have to appreciate like if my if my mind and heart and like I am just I can't be out there today, like it's okay not to be out there. So that's kind of how I would approach it. All right, last few for you. Why you move into broadcasting? Oh my gosh. Well, Gary, I don't know. Not a lot of people know this about me, but I wanted to be an actress so bad when I was younger. Like that was my, before soccer was my dream, I was like, I'm going to be an actress. So um, I always knew I liked television and I liked performing and I really liked the camera. <laughs> um, but then I started to like, okay, then I, ch- I chose soccer. I wanted to play soccer and this whole dream of um, becoming a member of the U S women's national team, like uh, got implemented in my brain, of course, in 99. Um, and I knew that was what I was going to do. And I, so I started pursuing that with like all my heart. And as, as I was just playing soccer, I, I just like the ACL club, I feel like my career as a player led me to broadcasting because when I was growing up, I, people always asked me like, Oh, you used to play. Like what position do you play? Did you play? Well, I played outside midfielder in a four, four, two. I then went to college and I man marked somebody. So, and then I played outside back and then I played center back and then I played forward and I ended as an eight or a six in center midfield. So I'm like, well, I, I played every position. Like I played every spot on the field for long periods of time, which allowed me to understand the responsibilities of every single position. So when I was in a film session, I wasn't just watching what was going on to my player. I was literally listening to what every, like every single note my coach said, because I was like, I have no idea tomorrow I could be playing that position. (laughs) Um, So I was very intentive in those, like, in the skills that that brought me as a soccer player and just understanding the game. 
But then as I started to get injured, I was sitting out a lot, right? And I was watching the game and I was seeing things, how the game developed and different tendencies. And um, then I was communicating those with my players on the field, either at halftime or like when they would run by, whatever, or come off for a sub. So um, I was very aware that I knew a lot about the game just through what I had experienced. And when I got injured the last time, I was like, well, gee, I knew this wasn't going to last forever, but this isn't really lasting as long as I would hope it to last. So I need to figure out what was next. And uh, I had coached on and off and coaching just didn't feel like it was the thing for me. I really enjoy the mentorship aspect of coaching, but like preparing training sessions was not my jam. And um, so I started off in Colorado, I called the local TV station and I was like, they did high school soccer games. And I was like, Hey, like I want to call soccer games and, um, I would love it if you would allow me to do that. So they like made a exception and we did a three man booth and, um, it was some of the funniest moments I've ever had in, in broadcasting, but calling games at that level, like I literally, started at the bottom. Now I'm here. Like I worked my way up and just, um, found that itch that first time and understood that like everything I had learned up into that, that point of my career. And even now, like I, my journey led me to that, that place of being able to communicate what was going on on the field to somebody who doesn't, doesn't see it the way that I see it. And that my perspective is, is really different and, um, hopefully interesting. And I just then, found a way to, um, not only make it, you know, it's been seven, seven and a half years now. Um, but yeah, I just slowly, but surely found my way into college soccer and then NWSL and MLS. And I called the CONCACAF, uh, qualifying last year for the world feed. So I just have found myself, um, hustling, you know, learning, taking what I learned from, uh, really sport and the injury recovery that things aren't always going to go great, but it's like riding out those ups and downs and not getting too high and not getting too low. And, um, understanding that like in the end, all of these experiences, like starting in high school soccer, that is going to help me when I call a women's national team game one day, like all those things are going to help. So, um, yeah, I just knew. And, and when I call a game, I just feel like myself, like, I feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So that's kind of how I got into it. It looks like you're having a blast when you're covering the national team. You know, it looks like mm-hmm. those post game walk around the pitch, like you're just enjoying it as much as the fans are and the players are, and you're, you know, you're laughing and connecting with the players. Where's the, what's the toughest part of of analyzing those games of of your friends? Yeah, I, it is. It is tough. Like with the national team, I actually don't. Um... I haven't analyzed. I mean, I did with, when I did CONCACAF, but that was on the world feed. So it's not like um, it's it wasn't like it was I was like heavy one way or the other. Um, but what's interesting is like I want my friends to succeed. Right. And I want my friends to do well. And I don't want them ever to think that like me saying that there was a mistake or a breakdown or whatever, that that is any way a reflection of like what I think about them as a human. So that's a really interesting way to um, try to call a game because you have to be honest and you have to be truthful. And I think one of the greatest things, and you've probably noticed this being in the U S for the past um, decade or so, right? Like you, you've seen the game and the knowledge of the game grow so much. And like, you can't just you can't talk to people on a broadcast like they don't know what's happening because these fans have gotten so um, knowledgeable about the game. So you have to be truthful and you have to like, you know, that's part of our job. So it it is interesting trying to um, navigate that. But I also think that, you know, if they're my friends, they appreciate that. Like, I don't, I don't have um, an, like, I don't let my friendship, get in, um, in the way of like calling a a game and saying what is really there because, um, you know, they're analyzing the game just like I am and they'll probably leaving. And if they made a mistake, they're like, yep, I made that mistake. So if she doesn't say I made the mistake, maybe she doesn't really know what she's talking about. So I think, I hope in the end, like, uh, 
we all are out for the same thing, right? Is is to uh, play and watch the game as as truly as possible, and, and know that like a mistake doesn't define us. It's just an opportunity to uh, get better. We talked last week about tw- on Twitter a little, just a little bit about kind of dealing with failure, and I wanted yeah. to get your opinion on this. Like I watched five or six games, college games over the weekend. In each one of them, the announcers, and granted they're not probably soccer announcers, it kind of bugged me because they were making excuses all the time for the team that was losing. And Mm -hmm. things like, well, they're getting better every game. Well, they're just, the road trip took a lot out of them. They'll they'll enjoy the three days off or something. Do you think that we're afraid to talk about failure or failing in our soccer culture? And if so, why? Oh, I, I absolutely think we are. I think, and I don't know if it just stops in soccer culture, right? Um, I think it might even be getting worse with like our ability to use social media to only show the good side of things, right? Um, but I, I think failure is like, for some reason, it's been turned into this bad word. Like you, if you fail at something, it doesn't make you a failure, it's just a result of trying to do something different or trying to do something like we should also always celebrate, like trying to do something. And, um, you know, I feel like in, in action is more of a failure than action. Um, and I've always felt that way. And, um, yeah, I, I responded to that tweet that you had because I thought it was so powerful. Like I had an interview with our, our, um, brand new coach and I said something that wasn't, you know, I was doing my research and didn't fully do the quality research that I should have in this one aspect. And I asked him a question. He was like, oh, well, that's not that's not true. The The context behind the question was good, but like the details that I provided were not accurate. Mm-hmm. And I was I like dealt with the ramifications of that afterwards. And I was so embarrassed. And I was like, I'm sorry. Like, I didn't mean to. um I didn't mean to offend you. He's like, oh, it's OK. I just didn't want to throw you under the bus and like say it wasn't true. And like that for me was really great to like have that communication with someone and be, you know, try to ask the question because the question was good. It was about like all these, these players in the men's national team in the nineties and how they're now in great positions in um, either MLS or U S soccer, you know, they've, they found their way to be still so involved in the game. And I thought it was just really interesting, like why that happened and did it, there was what was special about that group. And, um, some of the details I mentioned were not right. And I was like really thankful that he called me out one and that I felt awkward and I felt like I, I failed. Right. Because then I was like, you know what? I, I feel better about asking the question than just going through it. Ho hum. And not like saying something that I was curious about. Like, um, and so it really, you know, I kind of dealt with that for a couple hours afterwards and was so embarrassed. And then I was like, no, Jordan, like you got better today. Mm-hmm. You did something that challenged you that made you better. And even though it was uncomfortable, like, I don't feel like we get better when we're in our comfort zone. So like, um, you know, I, I figured out a way to flip it and say like, okay, failure is just a way of like learning from what happened. Um, just like we learn from what happened when we watch film and we see something good. Okay, well, this is going to work. Well, we also learn it's not going to work this way. And that's a failure. But if we can turn that failure um, on the field into seeing what could work or the opportunity that does lie there, then um, I think that's a, a good way to spin that. And we do have to talk about it more, right? Like we do have to, as players, as coaches, as people around the sport, um, recognize that yeah things might not always go well but like in that there's always opportunity to get better and like you have to use that in a way um but be real about it yeah but using a way to get better brilliant brilliant okay i'm sure there's going to be a lot of coaches here that are they're going to have players who are going through it and on the rehab side or have just done an injury acl where can they reach you how can they get involved where can they point their players to yeah, absolutely. So the aclclub.com is our website. And then um, so there's a, a lot of different stuff on there, including the link to the recovery course that I spoke about. And one of the things that I why I created the recovery course called the process is, um, you know, you get people give you gifts when you get injured with this injury. And I thought, what a what a great gift if like a team gave 
someone on their team this recovery course. Like everybody pools in a, a couple dollars and you can gift them something that um, helps them for six, seven months, not just, you know, a box of chocolates that they eat in one sitting. So <laughs> something that is like constantly checking in with them. So um, it's a really good resource for teams and, and for people to gift to others who are going through the recovery process. Um, so the ACL club.com and then on Instagram, we're at the ACL club and on Twitter, we're at ACL club. Um, and yeah, just one of the things that I'm really excited about in the next few months where I'm working hard with, um, a couple of individuals to create a risk reduction program that we're going to be launching and, and, um, going to clubs with, to hopefully have them, use and it's a big educational piece of like why we're doing this and why people need to uh have this risk reduction program and um you know it's all encompassing player coach uh administration and parents right it's it's all of us needing to know why this is important and how we can help these athletes uh you know hopefully ris- reduce the risk and uh keep them on the field for for longer and be healthier so uh, yeah, that's something that's coming out. So if you want more information about that, you can always connect with me, Jordan at the ACL club.com. Brilliant. Brilliant. And uh, keep us posted of that whenever uh, it comes out and we'll definitely spread the word. On oh, great. Yeah, I will. Absolutely. Jordan, thank you so much. It's been amazing. Really enjoyed Thanks, it. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, I loved it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much to Jordan for her time and her insight there. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. A little bit of a different topic. I think some of the principles that we we talk about pretty consistent every week in the podcast, they apply there as well. The the importance of communication, the importance of relationships, the importance of perspective and to be able to see the game not just through your eyes and your philosophy and your vision as a coach, but through the eyes of the player. And I thought that was really evident in that piece where she talked about how she sometimes doesn't need to sit on the sideline and watch the players train. And maybe that's an opportunity for the player to maybe not be out in practice that day. And and I thought about that and reflected on that. And sometimes from a coach's perspective, you almost expect that player when they're there. And I've probably said it to a dozen or so players, you know, get there, have a good attitude, have energy without really looking at whether they were okay or not. And that's something that, again, comes through consistent communication, good communication, informal communication, the building the relationships all the time. I think that relationship between player, medical staff, coach, I think it's so, so important in the modern game because there is so much support staff now and it's not just a coach, player, assistant coach there's now medical departments sports science departments analysis departments so part of coach education is now learning how to communicate not just with the player but communicate within the environment and making sure the player's well-being is at the heart of everything i really enjoyed her perspective on tony de chico and just again when you talk about we've had people on here talking about sir alex ferguson we've had people on here talking about sir bobby robson the things that those people do that is amazing is that they do the little things so well and those little things can just be, again, giving someone a little bit of space, talking to someone, connecting with someone and you can tell by by the way Jordan talks about Tony DiCicco that just his empathy and his way of supporting her through that there meant an awful lot. So. I really, really enjoyed that. The time flew by and, and again when I went by when I went back and reflected on practices and ways that I've dealt with injured players, it's definitely something that I could get way better than, way better and hoping to do that in the near future. And when you have a perspective and that perspective is opened and then the awareness improves and then maybe with awareness and with perspective should come should come more communication. So yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts on that there. At Gary Kernine on Twitter, at Gary Kernine on Instagram. We've got a few ones coming up that are different topics, just different side of management, different side of support, different side of, of the game that, that we haven't talked about before. So I'm excited to bring these out. Again, if you haven't, please check out the webinars on the Modern Soccer Coach Community Platform. Excited to do those. September 23rd is the first one there. So we'd love to see you get involved in that. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great week. Goodbye.
Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions, and resources, head on over to Coach Kernine on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com. 